I wanted to um, I wanted to have a chat to you about the whole war on drugs thing because I finished reading Chasing the Scream and jumped into Gabo Mate and all that sort of stuff and it just um, I get worried whenever I start to feel um, like too for or too against something. Yep. You know, because I'm like, there must be a blind spot in my thinking here. Like, if I become too ideological, you know, about the war on drugs, but um, it's like I'm, I may as well speak to a master in this game here because I felt like I was getting that way when I was reading those books, dude. Yeah, well, it's 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 like with anything, you know, when when you start to learn about new information and it really, you know, gets you fired up, and you're you can tell one of your highest values is learning and getting this information. Then what happens? It piques your interest, so you dive deep into you know different people, different books and whatever you need to learn. So, and all of a sudden you kind of do, you build up these beliefs yourself and can get a little bit ideological because you're like, fuck, why is, why is the world the way it is? Why isn't it this way? And why doesn't it change? And you tend to, and I'm sure we're going to share a lot of the same ideas here because with anything you go through this learning curve and you're real fired up about something. And then you come into the real world and you kind of level out somewhere and you kind of find where you're, your, your beliefs and that lie after sort of, you know, w- within the next six months, one year and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, this whole, and we're going to jump into it, but this whole drug war thing, I mean, my beliefs haven't changed a hell of a lot. I mean, they've got more realistic as to why things are the way they are. I mean, there's, if you, if you look at the, the, the drug war as a whole, like let's say if it was a business, right? <laughs> Which it is kind of, but let's say, yeah. let's, let's say it was, let's say I was starting a business like 80 years ago, right? And I'm starting this business and then I'll look back at my profit and loss statement and everything and I go, okay, my whole idea was I want to eradicate drugs. I don't want people using them because they're evil and we'll, we'll let's talk about that, right? But, <laughs> but I want to eradicate Okay, drugs because they're evil. And over that time, I've spent uh, trillions with a capital T, trillions of dollars on this goal of eradicating drugs. And 80 years later, drugs are more easy to get and more prevalent and people are using them more than ever. If that was a business, I'd look back and go, that's a fucking disaster. <laughs> that's no good at all. But then when you, if you dig into things, then you can see something like that can't keep going unless someone is profiting from it. Yeah, and that's when you start to look at uh, privatised prisons, uh, corrupt police, mm. corrupt government. So there's a lot of people that are winning uh, this war on drugs, but it certainly isn't drug addicts or people that are using drugs because, you know, that's the, it might be a saying, it might be from Chasing the Scream or, or maybe Gabo Mate says it. it's not a war on drugs, it's a war on drug addicts, mm. right? Because you can't have a war on an inanimate object. It just doesn't make any sense. It's like, oh, I'm declaring a war on rocks or I'm declaring yeah. a war on, it's just, it's on pens, you know, yeah. it's just silly, right? And so there's always, there's always an agenda behind it. And, you know, it's become a war on drug addicts for the people who are the most uh, in pain people in our society. The people who n- need the most compassion and love have been the most attacked. Yeah. And so when you come at someone with an addiction, and this is from my experience of addiction, working with addicts every day for the last however many years, Mm. is that you're only going to make the problem worse when you start to isolate some of them and make them feel like more of a fuck up than they already feel. The reason why we turn to drugs is because we feel like there's something defective and wrong with us. So we're trying to escape. So it's like, well, let's now criminalize you. Let's stigmatize you. Let's put you in a jail cell. Let's make it hard for you to get work by having a criminal record and all of these things. So it's like, yeah, I, I, that's my little take initially, but I'd like to hear from you. Like you're the one who's delved into this stuff over the last however many months or so and read these books and had to think about it. And I'd sort of like to know what you've picked up in that time, what your perspectives are, and maybe I can shoot a bit back at you and we'll see where we end up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, your your point about it being a war against drug addicts is just case in point, almost checkmate in my opinion, because it just it dissolves the other argument that, um, you know, the irony of the drug war from that perspective is that we're trying to help people, you know, and that by continuing perpetuating the war, we're leaving a vast majority of our society behind. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's one of the really big things prior to, you know, I think before going down this path and, you know, befriending people like yourself and, and, and all this sort of stuff, I was always very, um, you know, on the fence, I suppose, but I was almost unconscious about drugs. I just viewed them as I didn't even think about them really. I think I was obsessed with footy and, um, yeah. you know, you start having to think about 
I think it was always in the back of my mind that it's not just as easy as Nancy Reagan made it out to be, you know, it's, you can't just say no, there's always that thing. <laughs> of, well, there's something deeper there, but I can't really put my finger on it. And then you start to have a think about the psych, the psychology behind addiction and what they're doing. And your point again, man, like they're trying to escape some kind of pain there. You know, I, I can't, I just can't see the other side to it. And, and that worries me because I, I feel like I've, I've, um, I feel like I've just thrown myself in this hole of the, the, the war on drugs is ridiculous and I'm not going to listen to anyone else and everyone should go away. <laughs> you know, it, it's like, I, I understand, I understand from a, you know, I was about to say, I understand that other side, but I just can't fucking figure that out, man. I just, well, let's, well, let's, let's, let's talk to the listeners then let's start to educate, you know, we've, we've read about this stuff now. So the, the war on drugs starts with a man named Harry Anslinger back in the thirties, I believe. And, and it's so funny reading about his story. So basically he was uh, part of during prohibition, him and he ran a whole team who were keeping, you know, arresting people for uh, using and selling alcohol, right? Cause you weren't allowed to, you know, and it was so funny that, you know, you, you don't see like the, uh, what does Johan and Marie say? It's like you don't see that the, the CEO of Budweiser go into the CEO of, of Schmirnoff and shooting them in the face, right? It just doesn't happen because alcohol is legal. There's no need for that kind of and, – and this is another point. So when you, when you make drugs illegal – it doesn't mean that people don't stop using them. There's such a dem- – like, we've always used drugs, yeah? From when we were primates, when we were monkeys, we would go and, you know, pick mushrooms off the ground and have some sort of altered state of consciousness. Humans yes. like drugs, right? We can't get around that fact, right? Now, what we need to understand is that you, Harry Anslinger was a guy who – he was racist even by 1930 standards. He was seen as a racist back then when everyone was fucking racist. That's how bad of a racist he was. So he hated black people. He also hated drugs with a vengeance, right? And why did he, mm. why did he hate drugs? Well, it's so funny because what, what all the work I do in talking is about trauma. I'm obsessed with trauma because I believe trauma is part of our human condition. We're all traumatized to an extent. And if you're looking at drugs or alcohol or gambling or shopping or sex or relationships, codependency, all of these uh, surface level manifestations that we run into issues with mm. all come from trauma. They're all a trauma response at the end of the day. Um, and as I was reading about Harry Anslinger, it just, it just clicked in my head. I'm like, ah, this has all come from his trauma. Oh, yes. Good point. <laughs> because he, he, he used to live uh, in some rural part of probably been Oregon or somewhere in the States mm. and um, in, in like a barn and the barn next door was, and this is the whole reason that chasing the screen was named chasing the screen mm. is that, um, there was an African American lady who would always just scream and yell out, and um, Harry's dad would tell him go to the local pharmacy because you could buy heroin or morphine. It was back then you could just buy it over the counter, right? And he's like, go and get her a morphine because she's addicted, and she'd be screaming, and he'd get the morphine on his horse and cart, and um, she'd stop screaming. So he just developed this, and it was a trauma. This is like a ten-year-old boy. This is a traumatic experience, and his result, his response to that trauma is, you know. Black people are evil. They're like weak. They have to use drugs, blah, blah, blah. And drugs are evil in of themselves, yes. right? Which is once again, this is where, this is kind of the birth of the war on drugs before that word was ever um, created. So when Harry's running this department during prohibition to try and stop people drinking and selling alcohol, he has no problem with marijuana. He actually said, yeah, oh, it's not that much of a big deal, people, because you're allowed to use it once again legally back then. Mm-hmm. But then what happened? Prohibition ends right they decide hey this whole uh making alcohol illegal is causing way too much trouble (laughs) let's just make it legal again so we can get the tax we can regulate it and um and all that kind of thing so now harry has himself and this whole department that he runs that are going to look like they're not going to have jobs they're not going to have anything to do because there's no alcohol uh enforcement uh needed so what does he do he goes after marijuana this is where it starts back then heroin or morphine and um things like cocaine, they were used, but not Mm. a great deal. Yeah. You could buy cocaine related products over the counter as well, but they weren't a a big thing, but a lot of people were starting to use, you know, marijuana back then. So we thought, hang on to keep us in a job, 
let's uh, see if we can demonize this drug, right? But when I read Harry Anslinger's story, it reminds me so much of Hitler, right? Not, not on the same scale, but someone who was so full of hate and yeah. anger, but thought they were doing the right thing. That's but in right. fact, in that, in that, in that pursuit of doing the right thing, they created so much more of what they were trying to stop. And so what happened, he got hold, there was a story of a young fella in America who hacked his family to death with an ax. And so he grabbed that story, went to Hearst, who was, you know, that uh, Randolph Hearst, whatever his name was. He was the big news outlet at the time and said, look, this is because he, because of marijuana, he took marijuana and hacked his family to death. And it got, it went, it went viral. Like viral back then was, you know, newspapers and telegraphs and stuff. <laughs> um, but basically um, he's like, if you use marijuana, you're going to hack your family to death. You know, years later, they looked into the psychiatric records of this fella. There was never any evidence that he had used marijuana in his life. And actually he had a history, a family history of psychosis and insanity and stuff. And, and he was actually, the family was told he should be put in a home a year, year earlier. And they said, no, and you know, this happened anyway. So this started putting fear into people, you know, and this is, this is so prevalent thinking about this stuff now with COVID and all the fear and everything yeah, going out there. Right. So all yeah. of a sudden uh, marijuana is demonized and now he's drug enforcement. Yeah, as opposed to this just alcohol now, it's marijuana and other drugs. And so he campaigned and made, you know, to make marijuana progressively through each state. You know, like now it's the reverse is happening. It's slowly becoming legal in more states. He would made it illegal progressively in the states by spreading a lot of this fear. And that went on to, you know, heroin and cocaine. And um, the story uh, that's explained in the book around Billie Holiday, the amazing African-American singer, it, it breaks my heart. Like I, I, I tear up when I hear it. You know, there was many instances of him destroying lives, but Billie Holiday being a very famous, um, he literally destroyed her life because he, she was the epitome of what he hated. She was African-American. She was a heroin addict, an alcoholic, um, but also she was standing up to the white man. You know, she, she was singing songs about, um, black men being lynched in the streets, mm. you know, in these white cabaret clubs and she gets shit thrown at her and she's like, I'm not going to stop fucking singing my song. Um, I won't go into that full story now, but I really uh, encourage people to look up that story of Harry Ann Singer and Billie Holiday. Cause it's horrific. He ended up, he killed her at the end of the day. Right. Um, and, and tortured her in the process. Um, and oh, yeah. so like her, her, her story was she was working with her mum as a sex worker at 14. She was being repeatedly raped day in, day out by, by grown men as a teenager for years and years. And it's like, you talk about trauma, no wonder someone turns to alcohol and then heroin to try and deal with that horrific stuff. And for her to be demonized, it just, yeah, it, it breaks my heart. It's just, it's, it's I hate it. It is. And so what happened as well, though, that I think that actual part is becoming a movie. Thank God, because her story does need to be told. And, you know, the way she fell in love with jazz in the beginning and, you know, instead of being paid, she wanted to go down to the basement and listen to jazz music. And again, I I said, we won't talk about it, but we will. Let's talk about it. it. (laughs) Because she, she was singing this song called strange fruit which was about the, the lynchings and, you know, he, uh, Harry Anslinger's agents went to her and said, you don't fucking sing that song ever again. All right. You don't mm-hmm. sing it. And she was basically, she's like, fuck you. I'll sing what I want. This, this is my art, you know? And they, Harry Anslinger hated jazz, like the whole genre of jazz. Cause he saw it as like, uh, um, to disrupt his, his system and his structure and everything, you know? And so, yeah. um, basically he, uh, Harry Anslinger hated employing anyone in his team of African-American descent, anyone black, but you can't really send a white guy into Harlem undercover to try and make friends with Billy Holiday. So he employed this, um, can't remember his name now, but he was an African-American fella. He employed him and he went undercover and his job was to document her drug use and all the shit that she did wrong so she could get busted. Um, he went there and hung out with her, danced with her in the jazz clubs, all that. Um, Billy Holiday was so amazing. He fell in love with her <laughs> and, and, um, he, as and he was one. Yeah, as we, and so one of his greatest regrets, he still went through with the bust and he's regretted it. He regretted it every day of his life after that. And so they busted her, put her in prison. They took away her cabaret license. So she couldn't sing. It's like, if you want to hurt, torture someone the most, what do you do? You take away their ability to do what they love. And then anyway, she was, um, in her maybe forties and she had had to go to hospital. She had liver failure probably from all the alcohol and everything mm-hmm. in her life. And um, 
she told one of her friends, she said, you know, Harry Anson was men, they'll, they'll come for me and kill me in here. So please, you know, watch out. And people were protesting in the streets to let Billy out. And they'd handcuffed her to her hospital bed. Um, she was a heroin addict. So she's like, in heroin withdrawal and she's her friend is like can you give her methadone like and she was, she was having methadone and it was getting better yeah when harry anslinger's men come in cut off her methadone she died the next day um just a horrific story about an amazing woman and um it was it was one of her lines i think was you know you wouldn't take a type one or type two diabetic and just ban insulin so they couldn't have it anymore you know it's just it's torture so harry anslinger was this guy who was just on this mission to he hated drugs he hated people who weren't white americans and he was just out to attack them through these means and he was a very like like hitler he was very influential he was very powerful because he, he went to the un and convinced other countries to uh, adopt these same principles of this war on drugs. You know, Thailand, where I'm living right now, literally went to the UN and the Thai officials said, look, we don't um, have a real issue with drugs. You know, we've got a pretty good community-based culture and have, you know, don't really have a drug problem. We don't really want to have, make drugs illegal and have this war on drugs and, and criminalize people for it. And he basically said, okay, that's fine, but we'll cut any, any deals that people had selling things to the U S he'd say, well, we're going to cut all that out if you don't follow suit. So people did, uh, other countries ended up following suit. And so thus we have this, this war on drugs. And then you get into the whole racial thing where, you know, I think with uh, uh, especially the thing of cocaine, like in the eighties, crack cocaine was the big thing in America and it was seen as it's a black person's drug, you know, and it made black people go crazy and everything. And the truth is crack cocaine and powder cocaine is chemically, scientifically the exact same substance, Mm -hmm. you know, and actually white people use cocaine more than black people yet 80% of incarcerations for cocaine are black people. Right. So it's, it's at the end and, and at the end of the day, there was actually uh, some documentation taken out um, when they were looking at, there was a, a police officer who I think their, I can't remember, it was, it was a family member died of an overdose. So they wanted to get into this police force and get into drug enforcement and, you know, make a difference, like get drugs yeah. off the streets, which is impossible by the way. Um, so they wanted <laughs> to do that. Right. And so they get into this drug enforcement and, and they all of a sudden realized you know, they spoke up and said, how come all these drug busts we do, they're always in black neighborhoods. Mm. Like, why don't we go to white neighborhoods? And literally that the, the transcription, their superior said the, the people in the white neighborhoods, you know, they have contacts, they'll get lawyers, you know, their friends are journalists with it's too much worry for us. So we go for like the low hanging fruit. Right. And so then she realized this is a very political and racial thing as opposed to actually trying to help people who are on drugs. Um, so she ended mm. up getting out of the police force and, um, and all that kind of stuff. So basically, you know, this, this whole thing, it's, it's racial. It comes from the height of a man who was very uh, influential, who people don't know. And, you know, like we said at the start, it's just, if you're looking at it objectively and what the science says, what we're doing isn't working. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to refute that. And I think what's even harder for me going down this road is to, is to fathom that it began from one dude, you know, like you likened him to, to Hitler. And I think it's a very fair comparison given the absolute travesty that has occurred as a result of his actions. Yeah. And that's, and that's, it just kept, as I was, I've sort of gone over his story again and again. I just kept getting, getting that Hitler, the same vibes going on. Yeah. Cause at the end of the day, you say the same thing. You're like, how did Hitler get all these people? <laughs> like you, you look him up, look at Hitler up there giving one of his speeches early on. And you, we don't speak German, but you can sort of yeah. look at the body language. You're like, Why the fuck are they listening to this dude? Yeah. He's clearly <laughs> crazy, you know, exactly. but, but he was obviously very intelligent at influencing a group. And when yep. you've got someone that full of hate and anger and who just has this uh, tunnel vision of what they want, um, you can. And I mean, back in that time as well, I mean, a lot of people were looking for excuses to demonize um, African-Americans, Chinese people living in America. So it was kind of like uh, they found their uh mode of administration of, of getting to these people, you know, and mm. obviously being able to affect the UN and everything. Cause I mean, America being so powerful that they had that leverage, but yeah, look, you look back and go, well, why did they listen to this guy? But I mean, now we, now we just have so much more information. 
That's right. You know, we have so much more. Like you, you spoke about Nancy Reagan, just say no. And at that time, there were the the ad campaigns of. Have you seen the one of the guy frying the egg? And he's like, yeah. "This is your brain on drugs." Yeah. <laughs> it's so. Oh my funny. god! It is. <laughs> And you're like, oh my God, but, and this is why I'm, I've got such an issue with most drug education in schools Mm -hmm. because it doesn't work because we're just, we're lying to kids. Mm -hmm. We're saying drugs are horrible. Drugs are bad. Drugs are evil. If you try them once, you'll get hooked. Here's some pictures of people who've used drugs and it's all these horrible pictures and blah, blah, blah. And you're just using scare tactics and you're not being realistic with, with kids. Right. Because I know for me, um, and this is true for most people. There was actually a study done on drug education in schools and shows it either has no effect or it has the reverse effect um, mm. of what they're trying to have. Because you imagine you'll just get, get told that this enamored object, this drug is evil, 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 bad, bad, bad. And all of a sudden you go out and when you start experimenting with drugs, which m- most people in everybody good, good, do, good. <laughs> and you go, you're like, hang on, this is great. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, any any things that those drug education people said that are actually good advice, good they're point. thrown out the window with everything else. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, so imagine if imagine if seventy percent of this education was actually really solid and really good. The other thirty percent was this bullshit scare tactics. Drugs are bad, bad, bad. Then you have drugs and they're great. And then you go, especially if you're someone who has trauma, you have mental illness, you have issues going on with finding your purpose, then drugs serve a really good purpose for you because all of a sudden you can feel some feelings that you haven't felt in years, mm. right? I'm not, I'm not condoning them. I'm saying that that's, that's be real here. But, but then all of a sudden, all my mind goes back to drug education and goes, oh, they were full of shit. Whoosh. And all of that just gets thrown out the window, right? And so that's why I think uh, drug education is, is, is no good. Um, how did we get onto that? Yeah, the brain on drugs. Yeah, so mm. well, I just think we, we, now the latest science is showing. Uh, I'm pretty sure Dr. Carl Hart is referenced in the in the chasing the scream, and he is a professor out of Columbia University, um, and he's done great work. He's once again he got into this the neuroscience, particularly with drugs, because he grew up in a um, poverty stricken neighborhood in part of Miami, and he he listened to the media and said, oh, crack cocaine is destroying my town because people use it and that's why there's crime. That's why there's violence, right? Yes. But he worked out, no, it's not. Even if there's no drugs, there's crime and violence there. There was crime and violence there before crack cocaine. And what he found out is that of all people that uh, try drugs or use drugs in general, only 10 to 20% develop some sort of dependence or addiction, which is very important information because it means Mm -hmm. that 80 to 90% of people don't, yeah. all right? Now, that's, we need to understand that. This is where this whole, you know, not even once, just say no, this is your brain on drugs, all of that stuff, we can just, we can just leave that in the past now and say mm-hmm. instead of demonizing the drug, we can say, hang on, okay, so if 10 to 20% of people who start using drugs become addicted, and that's with all drugs, you might think, oh, no, heroin's more, methamphetamine's more. No, it's not. It's about mm-hmm. the same, right? Then what makes that 10 to 20% of people susceptible to addiction? Okay. Now we're starting to get somewhere. Now we can start to work with this individual and say, okay, what, what have you experienced in life? What's happened to you? Where are you? And we can start to help people as opposed to just saying, you know, you've, you've made a bad choice. And that, mm. that, that's another thing we're, we're going through an evolution right now. So this whole war on drugs started and, and went through till Jesus could be the, I don't know when the disease model first came out. It was the 12 steps see it as a disease model, but I'm not sure when they put that in their writings. But anyway, it's gone from addiction is a choice, right? It's a moral failing. Yeah. You've made a stupid decision. You made it over and over again. Now you're addicted. It's about, it's your fault. Now our judicial system still sees addiction that way. That's why drug addicts still get punished, right? They still get, you, you, you can be an addict and just have possession and you get put in jail, right? It's mm. ridiculous. Instead of getting the proper help that you need. It's imagine like uh, the disease is a condition of disconnection, disconnection from self, disconnection from others in the world. And it's like, wow, if we just put them in a, in a jail cell for a bit, that, that'll help them out. You know, that'll, yeah. that'll, 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 that'll be a tough love, you know? Right. So we've gone <laughs> from this, it's a choice to now we're, we're moving into, you know, it's a disease and that's been around for a little, little while. And now our medical system sees it as a disease now, which is much, it's, it's much better than the moral failing one because now at least we can get some sort of treatment. But once again, it's not the whole picture. 
right? And what we're starting to see now is that addiction is a, a coping mechanism. Yeah, it's a coping mechanism for some deep emotional pain, things that we've been through that we haven't been able to resolve or process or, or work through, you know. So we're going through this evolution of choice, disease, coping mechanism, but it's very, very slow because you imagine it's like the voice that the, and I like I still get it sometimes. Like I've I have so much compassion for drug addicts and work with them every day, but sometimes I'll be working with a client and I won't tell them, but in the back of my head, there's like a devil on the shoulder and it goes, would you fucking get your shit together? You know, yeah. that's Harry Anslinger's voice, you know, like, and, that, and that's that, that voice was echoed and you spoke about how you were quite, um, you're focused on footy and we're just sort of a bit unconscious about drugs. And this is where most people sit. So most mm. people, if you've been really touched by addiction yourself or a close love, well, not extended family, you didn't have much to do with, but really closely, you develop some sort of understanding. The vast majority of our population haven't. So what do they do? We pick up unconscious group beliefs, right? It's like, if I don't know about, um, What's the subject? If I don't know a footy, let's I do know about footy, but let's say I don't know anything about footy, right? Then I'll pick up kind of group beliefs around what footy is, you know, right? And I don't do that. I do that unconsciously. I do that through media, through shit that I've heard just randomly, through stuff that I heard growing up. But so I, I develop a, a belief or an opinion about it, but it's definitely not mine, right? So then you imagine Harry Anslinger and everyone like him, the millions of people. That, that echo the same sentiments for decades and decades and decades, those voices still ring in the back of our minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so this is why it's a, such a slow evolution of, of moving towards this compassion model as to this, from this punishment model, because we know the punishment model, it just doesn't work. Like the, the stats are there. Now, like I said, p people are benefiting from it, but it's, it's not the, the, ad, the drug addicts certainly aren't benefiting from it. It's yeah, it's a good, it's a really good point. And, you know, it, it might even be worth saying that the compassion model, you know, may, maybe not so much as a system in terms of actually legislation and, and, and putting place policies for that, but just from a, an individual perspective, it, it's difficult to have compassion for someone who's directly negatively influencing your life. And, and I remember this but when I first became interested in this, we had a family member of ours stay with, with my direct family um, um, and he'd been in and out of rehab his whole life. And, um, you know, the decisions that are, you know, cause I'm just seeing this happen in real time. I know I'm young. I'm just interested in making the AFL. I know nothing about emotional trauma. I know nothing about, um, social circumstances and, and the need for hope and goals. Like you said, the purpose and all that. And I'm seeing him make these decisions around the home and I'm feeling resentment start to build, you know, and I'm noticing to your point that the anslinger in me, just like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, how could you forget that? Why would you go there? Like, why would you drink again? Like all this, why do you want me to drive you here? Like, it's just like, get out of my way sort of thing, you know? It, and I, I, I feel like anger and resentment, it's easy to be angry and it's easy to be resentful. It's very, very hard unless I'm just in the, in the, uh, I'm, I'm an exception to the rule here. It's, it's hard for me to look unless I know at someone like that and go, damn, like what happened to you, you know? Mm. Yeah. The, the reason we get angry, this isn't just with this kind of situation, but any situation is because anger gives us a sense of control. Mm. Like we're in, in situations where we feel out of control, a lot of people will revert to anger because it gives us some sort of sense of power and control back into a situation that we don't fully understand. Mm. Now, if, if like people who are listening to this and take an interest in these kind of topics, they will, they can consciously then start to change their ideas and move from a, a judgment to a compassion kind of model. But someone like what you were saying, when you were younger growing up, that's just this, these group beliefs kind of being indoctrinated and what you're doing, you're just seeing a behavior and you're going, fuck that behavior, that behavior is shit ass. And it is right. That, that's the thing. We, we can't get caught up. I mean, I've done a, uh, a full course on families of addicts and it's like trying to help people understand it. So you, 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 you don't ex uh, let someone, you don't excuse the behavior. Yeah. If the behavior should ask the behavior should ask and you set boundaries, but you need to understand why the behavior is there. You need to understand what's underneath it. And, 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 and it is, and it is the hardest with addicts, right? Because what happens I'm, I'm yet to meet an addict, right? Yet I've met, my God, thousands. <laughs> I've yet to meet one who isn't riddled with guilt and shame around what they're doing. 
Yeah. So what happens, the more guilt and shame that we have, a lot of the time, the more of a mask we put up of, I don't give a shit. Mm. Right. And I've met people and their mask has been so strong. I hear a fuck about anything. There's, I get, it doesn't take me long. There's guilt and shame riddled underneath there, right? So all we see is we see the person and the, the behavior and the mask. And you're like, what a selfish cunt. This person's doing this. He's stealing from the family. It's what we do, right? <laughs> yes, and we're like, we, yes. just, and we, we can't handle it. So the whole process is being able to see past the mask, mm. right? So what would the, and this comes back down to once, once as a society, we understand that every addict is has fighting an internal battle that is it is horrible right they're fighting an internal battle that's horrible and it might look like they don't give a shit on the surface and these behaviors are unacceptable underneath that is is just this soul in just so much pain right now the group belief isn't that right Mm -hmm. but once the group belief does become that then all of a sudden kids that grow up we start to adopt that group belief and we start to see addicts in a different light, which means there's less stigma, which means addict will come forward and be more open and get help sooner. Right. But right now we're still, it's still very much judgment based. You know, there's this, there's this story of a yeah. tribe. Where were they? It's just a beautiful story that illustrates this. I can't remember where it is. There's this tribe in Africa, I think somewhere. And basically when a baby's born in the tribe, they have a, um, lady i don't know if it's the shaman or what but what they do they tune in and they create a song for this child before it's born it's a unique song every every baby has a different song and it's called their soul song and so when the baby's born the whole tribe gets around and they sing the soul song you know and it's this beautiful beautiful moment and what happens in the tribe whenever one of the tribe members does something wrong so they might they might stray off they might do something violent they might go against someone whatever it is they do something really bad instead of putting them in a cage the whole tribe gets around them sits around them and sings their soul song to them to the remind them who they really are right now that is a very yeah i know it's it's a very different way of dealing with wrong behavior than what we do in our culture because what we do is we say that was horrible let's put you in a cage for a while so you can think about what you've done yeah whereas this tribe is like no let us remind you who you really are behind the mask and behind the behavior that's how people get better that's how when people reconnect to their soul whatever you want to call it soul spirit true self whatever it is right whenever we reconnect to that then all of a sudden we don't need to use drugs yeah or our drug use slowly gets less and less and less yeah and if we want to talk about you know, the, the alternatives to the drug war. And once again, you'll know this from, from reading those books that you've read places like Portugal, places like Switzerland, you know, it's not, it's not like we have to have a philosophical chat about what uh, other options look like. There's other countries that have been doing it for over a decade now and they, the results are in, you know, Portugal decriminalized drugs, uh, Switzerland in, uh, I think it's uh, Geneva legalized heroin. So let's talk about the difference between those, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. decriminalization means that you cannot get arrested for possessing any type of illegal drug. Okay. So it's not legal. You still, if you want to go get drugs, you still have to go and get it from a a drug dealer or someone, someone not of uh, legal means. But basically if you get picked up and you just have a quantity that's just of personal amount, you're not going to traffic it. Then you just get a look, maybe a warning, maybe a fine, small fine, but you will not have any issues with uh, criminal records, jail, anything like that. Okay. Mm. Uh, Portugal been doing that for over 15 years now, I think. Um, basically uh, rates of addiction, rates of overdose, rates of crime on the streets, everything has come down, right? And at the time when they were trying to, can you, can you imagine in Australia trying to pass this bill? I'm like, man, it just would not happen, right? But Portugal were in serious problems. They had such a heroin issue before this. They were, they were, it's kind of like, um, I'm just thinking now, it's like an, an addict finding rock bottom, but a country hitting rock bottom. Yeah. It's like that moment where things, things are so drastic that you're like, we're going to have to make some sort of radical change here because their heroin use was just astronomical at that point. So they made the decision to, yes, uh, decriminalize all drugs. And the, the, the people who were very much against that decision they've been asked since and they said we would never go back to the way it was we would wow. never go back to the non decriminal the criminalization model yeah so even that the people who were very much against it and have seen the results right so that's decriminalization which means that the money spent on 
because they, they, they decided they wanted to make it a health concern. It's not a criminal concern, but it's a health concern. So the money that they used to criminalize and put people on jail and do bus or whatever it was, all that money that was saved is now going into helping people uh, get rehabilitated and try and get back on their feet. Yeah. Makes sense. Right, Tom? Does that make sense? Totally. <laughs> Pretty right. I think so. <laughs> right. Um, and that's the thing. It's been happening for 15 years. And the, and the people say, we don't want to go back to the way it was. We want this decriminalization because it's working. Now, legalization is, is another step. So legalization means you can... So right now in the US, they're going through this with marijuana, right? It's like, okay, we, we when marijuana for medicinal purposes was originally, so you need a special script from your doctor in certain states and you could get it. Um, and now legalization means you can go to your corner shop and you can buy marijuana, mm. um, you know, gummies, whatever it was. And um, legalization, what they did in Switzerland, so they did it for heroin because once again, they had a giant heroin problem like, HIV was, was rabid overdoses were rabid. So you can go to a uh, safe place, a heroin clinic, whatever you would call it. And basically you get free heroin, right? And it's pharmaceutical grade heroin, right? Mm. So many issues get run into with overdoses on heroin because you don't know how pure it is. You can get 30% pure heroin, 60, 90. You just don't know. If you're getting a hundred percent pure heroin every time, you know exactly what dose you need. Cause here's the thing. Every, every drug addict doesn't want to take too much. Yeah. We have this idea in our head of a drug addict, just more drugs, more drugs, more drugs. It's like, we want to take enough to feel high or feel normal or feel whatever it is. We don't want to take so much that we're going to, going to overdose. So yeah. you, you offer heroin addicts, free pharmaceutical grade heroin. They've had zero overdoses on heroin on that, mm. on that legal heroin, right? Zero. And it's been like 10 years or more. Mm crazy so what happens you get clean needles you get pharmaceutical grade heroin you get a shower there's a bed you can go there um you're not forced to at all but if you want to you can sit down with a social worker and they can try and work out maybe how you can get employment or get housing or that kind of thing mm. right once again makes complete sense and what's happening is that they're finding i think when they originally opened the place uh it's a very very low percentage I can't remember now. I'd have to look it up, Tom, but it's a very low percentage of the same people still coming, which means the majority of people who are, who have been there originally have actually got their shit together and got a job and have actually moved on. Right. Right. Because they weren't because they had the help that they need. Right. Normally if I go somewhere and, and use heroin, then I would get, you know, in trouble with the law. I'm trying to do it secretly. It's been cut by a dealer because they're trying to make more profit here. I'm getting the drug that I want. It's pure. I can go and go whenever I want. I can mm. go then see a social worker, get the help that, to try and get my life in order. And it's having fantastic results as well. So that's two examples, decriminalization and legalization, which are a far better option than, than the war that we're, we're aging at the minute. Yeah. You know, something that I think of as well as you're talking about, you said before, um, that sense of being able to find a purpose as well. And I, I can't imagine how if, if drugs are illegal, so there's no decriminalization. So even possession is still illegal. The fact that you now have a black mark against your name means that it's very hard for you to, to, to cultivate a future because you're so much more limited in what you can actually do. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Now that's why, you know, myself, you know, I've got a, criminal conviction I have a conviction of drug trafficking drug possession mm. theft of a motor vehicle all this all kind of stuff right um I, I was lucky enough that sort of when I got my shit together I wanted to start my own business so I didn't need to try and get a job right um but I can only imagine I can only imagine if I was you know trying to get back into the workforce you know, and all, and all of a sudden you go through and you're really excited. You're like, oh, I've, I want to start a new chapter in my life. And, um, you know, someone's gone through and like, oh, yeah, you've got all the qualifications needed, but we did a police check and, um, yeah, we can't, can't employ you, right? And this is, sorry, this is another thing that just triggered my memory. In Portugal, they've actually subsidized employers. So if someone um, has had a drug addiction or been incarcerated or whatever, then if you employ someone, right? Then you get, it's like half of their wage subsidized. Mm. You know, it's like what we do in Australia for, uh, you know, employing elderly people or that or disabled people, you know, it's like, it's, it's an incentive for the employer to take on these people so they can have a second chance mm. so they can find some purpose in their life. I even remember for me, you know, I went through quite a long 
uh, court proceeding. You know, it was months and months and I was in at the, the court six or seven times and um, I'd gotten myself clean at this point. I'd really sorted myself out, but I still had these, you know, uh, issues to deal with, you know. Yeah. And um, I remember one of my final sentencings, you know, I'd done all the right things. I'd done voluntary uh, a urine tests. I didn't need to, but twice a week I'd go on a urine test. And I just so when I went to the judge, I'm clean now. I was just started a diploma in uh, mental health and AOD. So ticked all the boxes. And, you know, this day I went in um, for my sentencing and I remember my lawyer, he said, okay, we've got all these clean urine samples. He, he started a uh, diploma in mental health and AOD. He wants to give back and help the community. And um, basically the judge just uh, that's right. That, that my lawyer said he's actually quite a bright guy. And the judge said, he goes, he's clearly not a bright guy. He's an idiot who's made stupid decisions and needs to pay for them. Right. Nice. And so I, I narrowly adjo- uh, avoided jail because I paid a very hefty fine. And I remember leaving court that day and I'd still, I'd done this work on myself. I was on the right path now. And it was so defeating to me right to like people who who i still beat addiction are some of the strongest people on the planet i i I so strongly um believe that and then just to have this authority figure and and that's sort of a representation of society kind of saying i don't give a fuck what you've done in your life now this is what you did and you're always going to be tainted by that and i can see why so many people then and like you said like they might go to get a job and get turned down they go back to these old behaviors right and then and then people will look at them and the judicial system and go oh we knew you'd be back here we knew you'd fuck up again so we didn't give this person a chance yeah, exactly. to build a new exactly. life for themselves exactly yeah i just i think just just let's just preface this so for everyone that doesn't know your story not every one of the listeners might have heard your um our first show that we did together and we've been friends for a while now which is awesome but just a quick background on like let, let's just let's just go into how how bad it got for you before you um um started to 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 get clean and move into the business because i think it's we're 50 minutes in for the podcast i think it's going to be extraordinary when people hear your background now having you literally recite books to me just to get, it's just a wonderful example of, of what the human spirit can do, man. So yeah. What, what, where, where did you get um, to? So I was basically started using, I was binging on alcohol through my teenage years. Like a lot of us do. I had a lot of uh, anxiety, which I never knew that I, I would never have said I had, I never knew about emotions. Basically, All I knew was that I wanted to feel good all the time and I didn't feel good most of the time. <laughs> okay. So I, I abused alcohol quite a lot. On my 20th birthday, I had my first ecstasy pill that started a love affair with ecstasy and speed. I used that recreationally for quite a long time that bled into using ice and GHB recreationally. Um, looking back, I would call myself a functional addict. I wouldn't have back then, but now with the, the knowledge that I have, I was a functional addict because the, the definition of addiction is, any behavior, it doesn't have to be drugs, but any behavior that I find instant relief in, I crave to do. And despite it having negative consequences in my life, I'm unable to stop. And it was having negative consequences in my life because I'd have these binges from Friday to Monday and be a zombie at work until Thursday. And that was sort of happened for quite a long time. Um, after, after a marriage breakup, my functional addiction went to dysfunctional addiction very, very fast. So I started using ice and GHB every single day my usage creeped up and up i was using astronomical amounts of the drugs um i was overdosing on ghb probably every second day um one of those was at the wheel of my car which i then drove into a wall on a freeway um thank the universe god whatever that i didn't hurt anyone else um i was living in a drug house uh, my 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 whole life it was it was a simple life right it was very chaotic and dramatic but it was very simple all i can cared about every single day was buying, selling, and using drugs. That was it. Okay. I I was dealing drugs because I ran through whatever savings I had quickly. And like 98% of drug dealers, I'm doing it to support my habit. Okay. Mm. There's only a very small percentage. We're talking drug cartels, you know, people are, um, who are actually manufacturing and that kind of thing that aren't drug addicts themselves. So, uh, I was dealing drugs, uh, that life obviously got me in a lot of trouble. Uh, I was arrested a couple of times, you know, high speed car chases with police and in stolen cars, um, all that kind of stuff. So I was, uh, you know, living, living that life, you know, I was really deep into that scene, you know, it was, it was, mm. uh, it was, it was interesting. I was dating a girl. She was a drug addict as well. Um, and like I said, lived in a drug house, people just coming and going all the time. No one really slept. I would sleep maybe once every four days. 
So I'd be awake for four days, then I'd sleep for about 20 to 24 hours, and then I'd be awake for another four days. Um, and that was sort of my routine. <laughs> Not mm. routine, but uh, I would, I'd <laughs> morning routine, I, I would, evening routine. I would, be, I would barely eat. Like I would, you know, I'd be on the way to a drug deal and I'd pass like Hungry Jacks or Maccas and I'm like, fuck, I haven't eaten in like a day. So I'd pull in, scoff some Maccas and then keep going. And that was kind of the the eating routine. Um, so I was an absolute mess, you know, and I ended up, you know, sitting in a, I was in jail for a few nights there on remand when I was up on the serious charges because I couldn't get bail. And um, yeah, just, just gaunt withdrawing from drugs sitting in this white you know white concrete room looking at the wall just going what the fuck is going on like how did you end up here you know i um then got transferred into uh map which is the underground jail in the city uh, below the courthouse um i'm in there with six other dudes all day Uh, once again this tiny room little toilet in the corner um one guy it's a funny story it's like well they do that one point they they slid food through the little slot in the door of the, of the cell. And before that, we'd sort of like, Oh, what are you in for? Everyone's not too happy and that kind of thing. And one guy's like, Oh, I stabbed my mate in the neck with a pair of scissors. And we're like, right. And I sort of watch out for that guy. Anyway, they're passing, they're passing the the little lunches through the slot in the door. And there's six of us in there and they put the fifth one. And the last one's the guy, the scissor guy. And he's like, Oi, where's me lunch? And they're like, that's it. We've only got five where's my fucking lunch? And I'm like, mate, have mine, have mine. Yeah. Good. So I was just trying to keep the peace. <laughs> We're stuck in this tiny room, six dudes, and there's a guy who's a stabber. And I'm like, just yeah. have my lunch, bro. <laughs> oh, I'll, God. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go hungry. And, you know, I remember, because I didn't know what was going on, you know, and I, they eventually grabbed me and I was in handcuffs and I was taken out through a door and I was in this big courtroom. Um, there's kids on the excursion for school there. And, you know, it's just, it's just, it's, it's, it feels so surreal looking back on it. And I, I, I got bailed while I was in jail for those couple of days. I'd had all these epiphanies. I'm like, I'm going to get back in contact with mum and dad and my old friends and I'm going to never use drugs again. Um, after getting out within an hour, I was back on drugs, wow. um, funnily enough. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's where I was. I was, I was in a place where this is where you get when you're in that scene. I knew I was like, I'm going to end up in jail or dead. It's just, that's, that's your options. That's your menu of options. Cause you, you, when you're in that scene and, you, and you're not addressing your pain and addressing, you just, you're unconsciously going about your business, things just get worse. And I was getting sloppier and sloppier using more and more. And so it was, it was jail or death for me. And I was lucky enough to uh, find out there was a third option. It's just crazy that, you know, he, he's a guy He's very tall, very handsome, very he's got goes to the gym. He bought me a coffee on the first day that I met him. He can just talk for hours about these incredibly deep topics. It you're 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 speaking about another life when you say that, you know, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. But we are but, well, this is the thing, and this is why I, I hate the idea of someone, whether it's addiction or I've got depression or anxiety or bipolar, I'm like, well, the, well, you've got this label and that's you for life. Nice one. Like yeah. don't, don't, don't let that become like literally. So if, let's talk, we're talking deep stuff on a cellular level. Mm. Every single cell in our bodies will regenerate in seven years. Like we mm. use ten, we lose tens of thousands of cells every day and they regenerate. So we're literally a different person every seven years on a cellular level. So don't let, don't let what's happened to you or what label someone has given you define you because yes. we've all got, we've all got genius inside of us. It just depends on what that is. You know, I'm obsessed with addiction and mental health and human behavior and why we do what we do. Yeah. But you speak to me about video games. I've got no fucking idea what you're talking about. Like I'm an idiot. (laughs) Right. So we've we've all got, we've all got a genius inside of us. It just depends on what area that is. And it normally comes from our own struggles. You know, that's why we get interested in things because we've had our own struggles. It's like, I don't just decide one day, like I used to be a tradesman. Um, I just decide one day, let me get involved in addiction and mental health, even though I had no issues with them. You know, (laughs) it just can't, it's just, we want to understand ourselves. And through that process, we understand ourselves a bit better. And then we try and pass that on to other people and try and create some sort of positive, positive ripple effect, which is what you're doing as well, Mm -hmm. Tom. Yeah. Well, look, this is, it's a good point you raised because this is, this is something that I um, struggle to understand with people who label themselves as, um, um, you know, former drug addicts, you know, or people that, you know, I used to be a drug addict, all this sort of stuff. I think used to be is, is probably a little, a, a, perhaps a better way of saying it. But if you're labeling yourself as someone that, yes, I'm a drug addict, like, you know, with regard to the 12 step program, um, how, 
how much harder is it then for someone to overcome that life? Because in one way, they're still very much attached to that label. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I, I say I used to be a drug addict because there's separation there. I used to be. But to say yes. I'm a drug addict and I'm in recovery, like when does, when does that recovery end? Yeah. You know, and, yeah. And, and, and I'll say it doesn't. You're always in recovery. And it's like, but here's the thing. Everyone's different, right? It's a very individual thing. For me, like I, I stopped using drugs, but see, I, I work with people now who are on drugs and I don't see, there's no difference. I don't think I'm better than someone because I don't use drugs and they do. That's ridiculous. I couldn't give mm. them crap if someone uses drugs. But if they say to me, I want to, I don't want to use drugs. I want to have a different experience in life and let's address that. But what I'm interested in is I, I, I didn't want to be off drugs, but then still have to, you know, deal with cravings or um because i noticed i got off drugs and i still had like these negative thoughts would come up and i'm like what the fuck are they blah 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 so i I, my my idea was getting clean of all the negative shit that i'd accumulated not just drugs but all these negative thoughts these negative beliefs these negative ideas about the world you know that's there's one thing getting clean but we want to live a a content and happy and peaceful life not just i got off drugs cool i know people who've got off drugs and they're fucking pissed off all the time, like yeah, they, yeah. they get in the car. There's road rage. They're angry at their boss. And there's it's like they're holding on for dear life. And I'm like, fuck, go back on drugs for Christ's sake. <laughs> You're so much calmer then. Exactly. Yeah, you were good to your family. Jeez. <laughs> and this is something that, um, you know, uh, Carl Hart he talks about this as well, and he goes, you know, there's nothing wrong with using heroin but it's your relationship to using heroin. That's the problem. You know, he said, if you're, an, if you're someone who, you know, you, you use heroin, you know, every night after work, you have an opiate and that's it. You go to bed, you fulfill your responsibilities at work and your family. Look, who's to say that's a problem, yeah. right? I know there's people who drink fucking eight beers a night and they're a cunt to their family. And I'm like, and then they're like, Oh, fucking drug addicts. And it's like, come on, you know, we need to, we're going to see this with marijuana. I, I don't, I'm not a marijuana man. I've it's, never i've never liked it it just doesn't doesn't agree with me but um we're gonna see this as marijuana becomes legalized and it will get legalized here eventually because we Mm -hmm. tend to follow what the u.s does and we'll see it you know people will start to smoke a joint instead of having those beers and for a lot of people that'll be a much better option um than having the beers you know and i think Mm -hmm. and that is the case with other drugs as well i mean there's a time and place sometimes to i mean methamphetamine i mean military has been using methamphetamine since the thirties. Like it's been their go-to drug for pilots and all that kind of stuff. So it's like, yeah. what, what doesn't matter what we're doing coffee. I, Tom, I stopped coffee yesterday. Right. Um, I love, I love coffee, a coffee right? story. I love I, a good coffee story. Well, this is a non coffee story. Cause I haven't exactly. had it. Right. And like, and I love coffee, but I didn't have it. And today I feel fine. But yesterday, my God, the headache I had, it was Shocking. just horrible. I had a nap in the afternoon. I had a headache all day. And I'm like, fuck, probably a good idea to stop for a bit if this is the result I'm having when I get off it. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I do that. I do that because you want to let it know who's boss. Like, what's my relationship to this thing? Yeah. Am I being run by this thing or am I in control of it? And that could be mm. the same with marijuana, with alcohol, with other drugs, you know, because like I said, most people don't have a problem with drugs who use them, but mm. some do. And they're the ones who are solving a better problem for. Yeah. It, it, it's always that relationship, you know, and I can relate to uh, training you know, becoming obsessed with playing football, which is what ended up, you know, doing my second knee injury and then CrossFit. And it was just like, I couldn't get rid of it. And then, and I always, I was always interested in the karma cycles that the pain and pleasure karma cycles and the the training justified the binge eating, which justified the training. And I couldn't get out of that cycle. And then when I couldn't train anymore, because we went overseas and my knee started to really hurt, I noticed that there was no pleasure, but the pain still remained. And the coping strategy for the pain was all the binge eating. So it's like, whoa, what's going on here? You know, but you see those, those cycles and it's just like, I'm not even hungry and I'm still eating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's so unconscious most of the time, you know, I always say it's like, if you want to know why you do something, stop doing it and watch what happens. 
It's like people who smoke cigarettes are like, oh, I just, just don't have a cigarette for 20 minutes when you're about to light one up and just watch what happens. Like, well, I get, I get edgy. I get really uneasy. Like I just want it. I'm like, oh, you got anxiety. No, I don't have anxiety. I just feel uneasy. I'm like, you've got anxiety. <laughs> That's why you smoke. <laughs> you know, you, you find out a lot of information by not partaking in these behaviors. And so it's interesting mm. to, I think it's interesting to look at your life and just say, hey, what am I, what am I doing compulsively? You know, what can I look at here? Um, a lot of people don't want to do that though. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, when I used to, you know, go on these benders, alcohol and drugs all weekend and everything, and I just, I just didn't want to look at it. It's just, that's what I wanted to do at the time. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, little did I know I was just trying to escape because I, I felt trapped in my own head, in my own body and everything. And that, and that helped me get out of it, you know, but a lot of people mm-hmm. just say, like, I just like to get get fucked up i'm like what does that mean well, yeah. let's talk about that I, I used to have so many people come into the center and they're like i don't know i just i just like getting fucked up i'm like good let's talk about i love let's dive deeper because that's it's like a throwaway line I like yes. the coffee i just love coffee and i throw it away and then i'm like oh let's just try not have it for a couple of weeks it's painful but it's like it's good to assess these relationships that we have because we're in a relationship to everything not just people we're in a relationship to substances we're in relation to our thoughts our emotions it's good to um take inventory on all that, you know? But if we come back to the drug yeah. war, which is what we're meant to be talking about, mate, go, you go. Mate, I just, I, I just love chatting with you. Um, any, any, excuse, <laughs> any excuse will do. Um, did, you, did you come to any kind of revelation by not having coffee yesterday? Did anything come up for you? Um, yeah, I was a little, uh, little rebellious teenager, Ryan, came up, yeah? Because it's like, I, I love me because you know melissa she's she's therapist yeah. as well so we have these open discussions and yeah whenever one of us is emotional well whenever, well whenever we're having you know one of us is getting a bit cranky she'll go who, who am i talking to and i'm like yeah this is 10 year old ryan having a tantrum <laughs> but yeah yesterday was like a, yesterday was like a rebel and he, i had this headache and i'm like why am I fucking stopping drinking coffee anyway? You love coffee. Oh, you're going to take away something that you love? You deserve coffee. You've been a bloody drug addict. You've been drugs. Why can't you? <laughs> it's just these justifications, right? Coming at me, coming at me. And it's like, because Melissa, she stopped caffeine. She's very sensitive to caffeine. She stopped about a week ago. I think that's mm. what's prompted me. And so then my mind's like, oh, just because she's doing it, you're doing it, and blah, blah. There's all these funny little things start coming up. And you just watch it. You just watch the voices. Um come and go and that's an important thing as well you're just watching all this this crazy voice up here that doesn't shut the hell up and doesn't know what it's talking about you know i always tell people like if i'm working with a client i'm like who who just aren't very aware of their thoughts they're very automatic i'll just say imagine that whatever that voice in your head is take it out for one day and imagine it's sitting next to you or imagine it's a mate right so if you're sitting on the couch watching tv it's next to you if you're in the car, it's in the passenger seat. If you're at work, it's sitting next to you. And just listen to what they have to say. Don't judge, just listen. And at the end of the day, ask yourself, if that was a friend, would I take their advice? You would say, my God, no, they're crazy. I would not take their advice. <laughs> one minute they want one thing, one minute they want the opposite thing. They tell me to do something and then when I do it, they beat me up for doing it. I'm like, I would not take their advice at all. They're crazy. Yet once yeah. it's back in here, my God, we listen to this thing. We take its, it's advice me. when uh, it's me. Yeah, yeah, it's mm. me. And no, it's not. It's not. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a machine. It's an automatic thought generating machine based on every single past experience that we've had. And it doesn't make sense a lot of the time. But we, and we, if we're talking about drugs in particular, you know, n- nobody in the history of drug use ever used drugs without their mind telling them to do it first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then the question becomes, why is your mind telling me to do drugs? Mm, mm, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a funny, it's a funny thing. And we can, we can fall out of that awareness all the time, you know, and that, you know, for me, just um, on the, on the off day that I do meditate, despite what I know I should do more, I'll sit and I, I don't meditate to any kind of guided meditation or anything. I don't get much out of that. I just, just sit in silence yep. for 20 minutes or so. And, I'll be like, oh, this is pretty interesting. Like, yeah, oh, this is so good. I should do this more. And then all of a sudden I start thinking about, fuck, that podcast was sick. I can't wait to record yeah. it. I can't. Oh, shit, I've got to get the promo photo from Ryan. Oh, hang on. We're sitting, we're, we're, we're meditating. <laughs> like, oh, but you thought about that promo? Shit, he's right, he's right. <laughs> you know what I do? I, I, I have been doing a lot of work. I'm working with a lady at the minute as a client myself. Um, 
doing some work and it's sort of very deep in a bodily sensation work in your field. And I'll sort of sit there and it's like really connecting to your heart and your field and everything and getting out of this thing. And what I find myself, it's like, as soon as I connect and start to feel this peace, I'm like, wow, this is nice. Oh, this is what she was talking about. Oh, this is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. As soon as this thing starts, you're not there anymore. You're like, fuck, I just got out of it because I kept wanting to commentate on how good I felt. Yeah. <laughs> like just picture like, just picture someone sitting there being like, oh, this is so good. Man, I'm so fucking enlightened. Oh, fuck. I'm not enlightened anymore. <laughs> oh, hang on. <laughs> Dude, I, I'm a Buddha. Can't go I'm back, Buddha. go back, go back. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just, I know. It's 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 a ravenous beast. This thing up here, and um, I think taming that is the is the biggest challenge that we have. Getting off drugs is nothing in comparison to taming this beast. You know, so mm. and I, and it's just 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 having the awareness that you're not it is, I think, the key thing. Because you get sucked in, you get sucked in, you get sucked in. But if you're aware that the thoughts aren't essentially who you are, then you can keep pulling yourself back out and just sitting behind them and letting them go. You know. Mm. Yeah, and also also not becoming not becoming too attached with um, getting over that voice. You know, you hear so many times, and I went through this myself, so I know it's it's true that you know when you first start seeing yourself from outside and go, oh man, like you know, all of these things that happen to me, or the way I see the world is responsible for all of my issues, all of my issues, you know, it's not my fault what happened to me. I've got to sort this out now. It's the buck stops with me. And then I found that I was getting attached to this, like, Oh, you know, there's a thought there, or I need to do more work or I'm still not quite there yet. And that all of that was becoming really boring and painful and was perpetuating the issues that I first began to try to get over. So eventually it was, I started to read a lot of David data and he, he was talking about how, you know, the truly enlightened ones laugh the most and they, they enjoy sipping red wine or smoking a joint here and there because they're, they're, they're at peace with the fact, the paradox is they're at peace with the fact that they might never, ever not be at peace. And that makes them at peace. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's beautifully explained, Tom. It's, that's the thing. It's re- really like people like me and you shouldn't have a job at the end of the day, right? Because what happens, everything comes from a deficiency story. Every perceived problem that someone has is because we feel deficient. And and that's the the trap that we get into is that I need to work on myself, right? If I need to work on myself, then I must see myself as deficient in some way. So I'm not accepting myself who I am. And so that becomes this uh, chasing a rainbow, I like to call it, which is like someone, if if it's not your thoughts, if you're just unconscious and you're trying to get the next car or the next amount of money, it's never enough and you just keep going and going and going because you'll always feel deficient. So it's like you start from that place like there's people that you were talking about. It's a complete and utter acceptance of who I am. I don't need to work on anything. Well, I'm just here to enjoy life, right? Then then we can start, then you start to, uh, all these faculties start to come out of you and this joy and everything, not because you worked on yourself so much, but you completely accepted yourself, right? Now, if you if you are, are, are stuck, in traumas you can't do that so you will have to address the traumas first but then it's like this complete uh acceptance yeah because only from that place of acceptance you know and that doesn't mean that that then we don't do stuff you know because like because like you and me we love learning clearly it's high in our values so we'll go and we'll read a book because we love learning not big but then where's it coming from? Is it because I feel deficient of this information or is it because I feel completely, I'm completely uh, accepting and who I am. There's nothing I need to change, but I want to go do that because it's fun. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. It's, a, it's, it's, it's subtle differences, but most people, and I still find myself getting dragged into it, is this story of, of deficient, deficient, deficient. So what I'm doing, I need to go to the gym because I'm not in shape enough or I need to read that book because I'm not smart enough. And all of that means I am deficient, which means I'm not enough, which means I don't yes. accept myself. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, it, it's so hard to... Well, but again, you know, this is, this is the point we made before where it's just, this is why it's important to practice self-inquiry and just every now and then just sit back and just be like, I wonder where this is coming from, you know? And yeah. um, that little game of reflection and then forward marching and reflection and forward marching, I think is going to be um, the, the winner, I think. But um, yeah, dude, j- just quickly as well, talk to me about these courses. So do you have, how many courses do you have rocking now? We're rocking a few now. We've got, um, yeah. I have to think. So the, so courses.centerforhealing.com.au. So we've got our main, uh, 
Well, this is root cause therapy course. So root cause therapy is the modality that we curated through our time of creating the center, working with people, addictions, mental illness, uh, mm. stress, whatever it is. So it's, it's trauma work at the end of the day. And trauma work, it, it, like I said, we've all got trauma, right? Okay, trauma is... So trauma is an event that happens that overwhelms our system's ability to cope, our brain and our body, right? Mm. Which isn't, that's, it's not quite right because it copes, it just copes in a different way. Well, it stores an impression. So it stores an emotional impression and it stores a mental impression. And we normally create some sort of belief around ourselves and the world. And then we go through life and those emotions and those thoughts keep getting triggered because we go through mm. similar situations. So a lot of the work is just removing a lot of those old emotions and, and, and beliefs and, and thoughts. Um, so root cause therapy is our overarching one. And then myself and my colleague, Matt Nettleton, who's former drug addict as well, who now is a practitioner in the space. Uh, we've got a course for families of, of addicts, uh, which has been really popular. We've had a heap of people through that now. So it's basically someone's got a loved one, whether it's a son, daughter, husband, wife, sister, brother, whatever, friend who's addicted and they don't know what to do. This course is to try and uh, enlighten them on the subject. And uh, it's good because we created the course and we're like, I don't know how this is going to be received because our whole thing is you can't change the other person right? All you can do is change yourself and your energy towards what's going on, you know, because people, when, when, when someone's addicted, people see that as a massive problem that needs to be fixed. Okay. The whole idea. So imagine if I need to fix someone, how does that person feel deficient? Broken. Why yeah. that, why are they using drugs? Cause they feel deficient. <laughs> so that, it's, it's so counterintuitive, right? It's yeah. very counterintuitive. And we say that in the course over and over again, but it's dealing with our own energy, our own stuff so that we can come out of judgment and come into love and compassion, but also know that we set boundaries. If, if, if behaviors are, are putting us into resentment, We've all, we've got a set of scales, right? We're coming from compassion or we're going to dip into resentment. As soon as we dip into resentment, we need to set boundaries because resentment is suicide, soul suicide. It's a horrible state to be in, right? So we've got a course for families of addicts. We have just released a course on trauma. It's called Understanding Trauma. So there's a free mini course, which is just three short modules, bit of an intro, and then a, a full course on that. Uh, we have... What else have we got? We've got uh, on re- investigating your relationship to life. So different concepts around, you know, what it is to be human. So mm-hmm. our, our relationship with friends, family, whoever, thoughts, emotions, like we've been talking about um, with society. Uh, once again, we have a free mini course and a full course on that. And then uh, the other one's going deep, which is the first course that we recorded actually, which is just philosophies around mental health addiction, um, how it relates to spirituality as well. Mm-hmm. Um you know, not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about religious stuff and that kind of thing, but there, is, there seems to be a very, very strong link with, you know, people who address their trauma, overcome addictions, overcome mental illness, and also this kind of, you know, spiritual awakening, yeah. uh, I suppose you would call it, which just means understanding that, you know, it happened for me when I stopped using drugs. I realized that the whole world just wasn't about me, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, it's like your, 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 your ego kind of dissolves because all of these ideas about who you are is just concepts that our ego is created uh, unconsciously. And mm. so like when that stuff starts to fall away, it's kind of like, Oh, Oh, hang on. What's going on here? <laughs> oh, there's a lot more going on than I originally thought, which, which helps us feel more connected to ourselves and other people, which once again, helps us get past these addictions and these uh, depressions and anxieties so much. Mm. So yeah. So yeah, I encourage people to jump on take the free courses, see if you dig what we're talking about and um, you know, go from there. So yeah, that's been, uh, that's been, that's been great having the, as I said, with the families of addiction one, we haven't had one, um, negative comment yet i thought they'd be flooding in but we haven't did you really just get negative. What kind of negative just because what we're saying is basically in, in as much words stop making it about you yeah right so we're saying we're saying we're making the person who's taking the course take complete ownership for their emotional reactions and why they feel like they need to fix that person yeah so, so like i said it's very counterintuitive because people because people what they want the people i've spoken to because i've before we did this course both myself and matt have seen just hundreds of, of families of addicted loved ones and they want mm-hmm. a script. Mm-hmm. They want a script. They're like, just tell me what I need to say and what I need to do. And I'll go and, and say it like, like an intervention script, you know? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Guess, how are you? It, I'm like, uh, good. <laughs> well, we keep looking at your hand. No, nothing, nothing. It's like a cheating yeah. or a test. Oh, there's, there's nothing on there. <laughs> 
and the same well there should be nothing on there <laughs> which is good because because the thing is it doesn't matter what I, I could give you the perfect script to t- say to someone but if you're coming from a place of resentment or anger or wanting to fix that person then it doesn't matter what you say people read yeah. the energy of what you're saying and not the words so it's reframing that as well and a lot of people as well just don't understand addiction so you know mm-hmm. we talk about the link between trauma and addiction and a lot of family members especially because a lot of mums and dads and we're talking about, you know, there'll be childhood stuff there that has been a contributing factor to this addiction. And we're like, they're not going to want to hear that. But the truth is they do, you know, that they, that people have been a lot more open with this information than, than we thought. We just, we only get negative comments on the ad, <laughs> you know, people jump on. They're like, I, 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 it's so funny. Like how, how dare you, you know, charge people money and make money off people's pain or, you know, it shouldn't be called families of addicts. You're stigmatizing. I'm like, just take the fucking course. Link in so, bio. You, you, you know, and the, like you can, mine and Matt had a decade's worth each of experience of being addicted. We've now got a decade's experience each of working with addicts every single day. And yeah. for the cost of one psychology session, you can get all of that experience. But people are like, oh, how dare you make money? It's like, all right, we'll just do everything for free and I'll live in a gutter for God's sake. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Go and start taking drugs again. <laughs> are you happy? <laughs> You're happy now? Yeah. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's funny, but you know, well, let's come back at the end just to the drug war stuff. Sure, sure. Maybe just some key points. Like, I think it's really important for people to know who have trouble grasping the issue is you, people are going to use drugs. The demand is going to be there. It always has been. To think that all of a sudden there's not going to be a demand. It's like mental illness is on the slow incline. Yeah. Same with addiction. It's on the, it's always, it's things on the slow incline. So I think that we're just going to all of a sudden eradicate it completely and no one will need drugs. It is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. And I always talk to people. I do the thought, I do the thought experiment. So you got, imagine that government's got kind of two uh, agencies, right? There's drug enforcement. They want zero drugs on the streets, right? That's their goal. Yeah. And, and it used to shit me. I never really read the paper, but every now and then, Back in Melbourne, I'd read the paper and there'd be front page, like big drug bust. It's like front page, you know, we've seized 300 kilos of methamphetamine and then you open up, this is how we did it. And you can tell people at home are like, oh, drugs off the streets. It does nothing. There was, it's like a drop of water out of the ocean. It makes yeah. no difference whatsoever. And it was funny because after I read one of these uh, front page stories of the bust, it was maybe three days later, I found tucked away on like page 17 in the bottom corner, the fact that for the first time in history, more people died of overdoses from prescription drugs from doctors than from illegal drugs from drug dealers, mm-hmm. right? In the year 2018, right? So for the first time ever, we, more people died of overdose from legal drugs than illegal, right? So it's mm-hmm. like, yeah. And then it was a tiny little article down the bottom. Of course there. It was. So, basically, of course it was. so basically we can't stop the demand. The question is how do we move from a, war against drugs model to a harm reduction model. Okay. Mm-hmm. And this is what places like Portugal and specifically Switzerland have been doing is saying, let's treat this as a health problem and use harm minimization. But you, you have to admit as a society that people, heaps of people are going to use drugs and yeah. we're just not mature enough in Australia. We're not mature enough to have that conversation. You know, I have a mate who lives in Richmond and they opened that, the um, injecting Injection site in sound. Richmond. Mm. And he's like, what are we going to do, mate? Like, what are we going to do about this issue? I'm like, you need to make legal heroin in that, in that uh, injection center. Whereas everyone's like, get rid of it. Cause we don't want junkies around here. Let's get rid of it. But it's like, no, have them there. Cause they're, well, what they're saying is now there's an injection site. There's lots of drug dealing happening around there. You give legal heroin in there, no more drug dealing. Of course. Who wants to buy, who wants to pay for shitty heroin when they can get for free pharmaceutical grade heroin? It just eradicates the whole uh, dealing and the violence that comes along with that. Because when you take, mm. this is why drug prohibition stopped. Because as soon as, no, sorry, alcohol prohibition stopped. As soon as alcohol was made illegal, it went underground because people still wanted to drink funnily enough right so then all of a sudden the business of alcohol goes to organized crime and gangs Mm -hmm. yeah organized crime if someone steals from them or tries to step in on their turf they can't go to the police because it's illegal they'll get arrested so they have to use violence and create a violent reputation to keep doing what they're doing and then what Mm -hmm. happens 
alcohol, people weren't drinking beers during Prohibition. They were drinking moonshine. They were drinking this fucking horrible shit made in bathtubs that was like 90% alcohol, right? And this is what happens with drugs. Drugs are getting more and more pure, right? Because it's being forced into this organized crime that are very good at, at smuggling, but there's no legal recourse that can be taken because it's illegal. So it's like yes. the, the war on drugs is just creating more drugs. Yeah. And, and one thing I really love about that idea of the from supply to demand when it goes underground is that it looks like an hourglass because um, one thing that he, that Harry wrote about in that book was what was called the iron law of addition, where it's because they have to try to get as much bang for their buck through that little squeeze where the, where the potential for them to go bust is, is everything. They have to get really good, pure, potent stuff in a tiny little packet so that people will always, always want it. So it, it creates more danger, more drugs, as you say, and, and more deaths. Exactly, yeah. Because, I mean, we, when you're, you know, getting drugs across the border, we can use Mexico to America for an example. Mm-hmm. The smaller, the smaller the size of that, package that needs to be smuggled the better yeah because yep. you know there's that's why it's if you use alcohol as an example you don't want to try and you know if i've got a car if i'm in a sedan i don't want to try and smuggle 10 slabs of beer <laughs> i want to smuggle a bottle of you know 90 percent proof stuff in the back because it's easier for me to smuggle and um you know putting all the power is in the hands of these you know the cartel in mexico they basically own the police you know, if they if they want someone killed, they get the po- the cartel gets the police to kill the people they want killed. This is this is the result of the war on drugs. It's just giving more and more power to uh, organized crime and people that are very very willing to use violence to make money. It's, and it's, yeah, and it's, the money is incredible. Like I read a stat that the the U.S. drug enforcement budget is thirty billion dollars, and they have an efficiency rate of less than one percent, which means they're stopping less than one percent of drugs being uh, moved uh, either over the border or throughout the U.S. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Doing a Imagine business, you KPI. put thirty billion dollars into trying and rehabilitate people, get them jobs, get them addressing their trauma. Like, ah, oh, it's so annoying, Tom. I know. I know. Well, but this is that thing. It's like you start to you know, you want to pick yourself up by your bootstraps and do what you can to change the world. But you get, you get to a point where it's like, wow, I'm just coming against this brick wall of policy. That's just so far behind. It must be spent. And you're right. And I think about it. It must be infuriating. Yeah, but then you kind of, like I said, it's this leveling out process. You don't get, oh, you just still, still tell I'm pretty fired up about it. <laughs> but you yeah, get you down to a point because that's the same with me when I, you know, started, I got off drugs and everything. And I'm like, I'm going to get everybody off drugs. I'll save the world, blah, blah, blah. But then you yes. sort of realize there's, there's many other factors in play that are going on. And you kind of, you integrate those other factors and work out how you can make the most impact with the resources that you have. Mm. And um, I think it's, it's, it's due to the internet uh, books like Johanna Ree, people like Gabor Mate podcasts of people talking about this stuff. Once enough people understand what addiction is and understand the war on drugs as a stinking pile of shit, then the more the policy will start to change until it hits a critical mass. It's not going to change because like that, that current structure, that current system, those current policies are serving people. They're not mm-hmm. serving drug addicts. That's for sure. They're doing the opposite, but they're serving people. They're serving the cartels. They're serving all of the corrupt cops. They're serving the corrupt government. They're serving a uh, uh, purpose, but once enough people understand what's going on, then policy will change because at the end of the day, people need people voting for them. This is why I want to get more, this is why I have and will continue to get more and more politicians on the show because I want to talk about these issues that, um, you know, two people that actually have some kind of stake in, in the game, um, yeah. you know, and and not, not even from a perspective. I mean, with everything that's going on in the world right now, man, you can see that just how many people have a complete lack of trust in their governments and, you um, you know, it, it worries me because, uh, you know, I'm not bureaucratic by any means, but it worries me that people are starting to be pushed. You know, you, you see what's going on in the US, but people are starting to be pushed towards these extremes because it's like, well, I'm taking life in my own hands and I'm going to do this. And, you know, with everything that's going on in social media, I'm, I'm, I'm all I want to see is just open, honest dialogue all the time about everything, you know, and, um, I don't care if it takes us years, at least we're not bombing and killing everyone. Um, 
and uh, and hopefully we can figure something out. But uh, yeah, I think it's uh, was it Voltaire that said I. Uh, I, I wholeheartedly disagree with what you say, but I'll defend my death or your right to say it. Mm. And I think that we need to understand that we can have, you know, we can disagree with each other without hating each other. Mm. You know, there's, I have friends and when there's certain topics we completely disagree on, and that's fine. I still love them. So, like we're allowed to, but we need to have these discussions because what happened, Harry Anslinger started this, such a, just a binary way of looking at things that just wasn't challenged enough, you mm, know? And it's like mm. now that there's a lot of us challenging that. Well, let's let's go back and forth and try to understand. Like I do talks in front of people and they completely get like what we're talking about now. We just, we, we get what we're talking about. But, you know, mm. I did a talk for the the uh, the Rotary Club. I got invited along. So this is old, old dudes, right? And they they couldn't get their head around it because they've, and, I, and that's fine. It's like oh, if I could just implant a little seed for them to think about it, because you got to imagine they've had seventy years of the the Anslinger, the uh, addictions of moral failing. It's a it's a stupid choice, and you deserve yes. to get punished for it. So for them to hear something very very contrary to that, it's going to conflict with a lot of their information they've had up until that point. So yes, um, I completely respect their way of looking at things, and I hope course, they respect mine. Did you do that with Kieran Palmer? No, nah, this was uh, a few years ago. Uh, few years just ago. A, an, an old mate who um, I went used to go to the gym with and he sort of followed along my story a bit and he's part of the Rotary Club and he, he just mm. messaged me one day and said, would you come down and do a talk? And I'm like, yeah, for sure. So, oh, right. yeah, yeah, it was just, uh, yeah. The coincidence, I think I think Kiz did a, um, a talk there. Was that in Hawthorne, the Rotary Club? No, this one I was... was... I could have this really wrong. <laughs> it's actually in Virginia. Yeah. They have they have they have Rotary Club meetings all the time all over the place. But I think that once a month they get a speaker in or something. So yeah, this was sort of golf club. Mm. Yeah, and it was either Roeville or Cranbourne or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. Good. Yeah. Well, mate, uh, I, I love having you on the show, man. It's uh, it's a shame that we can't catch up in real life. Are you coming down here anytime soon? We can catch yeah, up. Yeah, no, I'm coming or... back. Yeah, we, we are we are coming back. Uh, we're planning on coming back uh, November next November. month. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Subject yeah, to yeah. everything happening. Yeah. They, they extended visas till the end of this month, October 31st. And we've just been trying to look at flights, uh, but there's not too much available at the minute to Melbourne, but I think uh, in a week's time or so, there might be a few more open up. So we're just going to see where it's at. But at this stage, we're planning on uh, cruising back in November, mate. I look forward to a beer, maybe a coffee. I don't know. Absolutely. I don't know. Yes, very true. I'm not, I'm not attached to whether I'll be drinking coffee again or not. <laughs> Very true. Hardcore moonshine in a in a little uh, a little pot. <laughs> yeah, how can you get as much caffeine as possible into a into a little shot glass? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, dude, I'll put I'll put the stuff in the um we'll put the stuff in the in the show notes for um your courses, especially the um families of addicts. I think that's a really brilliant course, man. Um and mate, thanks so much for jumping back on the show. My pleasure as always, Tom. I'm always available to 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 chat about this stuff. I love it. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye. Hey, guys. If you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.